On the 4th of June 2017, an ATR-42-500, operated by Tyrom, was on a scheduled flight from Bucharest in Romania to Chisinau in Moldova. After landing on runway 08, the aircraft made a runway excursion. Nobody was injured, but the aircraft was damaged. When the incident report was released, the aviation press reported that the crew had skipped the descent checklist. Did that cause the runway excursion? Not at all. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordal. I'm an airline captain and instructor. It said that any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. But we should aim for a higher standard than that. This runway excursion was classified as a serious incident and it was agreed between authorities of Moldova and Romania that it would be investigated by the Civil Aviation Safety Investigation and Analysis Authority SIAA of Romania. Sadly, the report is very short and many safety aspects are not discussed at all. I will come back to that later. The aircraft was an ATR-42-500, registered Yankee Romeo Alpha Tango Bravo. It was delivered to Tarom, the national airline of Romania, in 1998. And the company used the aircraft until 2020, when it was returned to the lesser. Chisinau is the capital of Moldova, and the airport has two runways, 0826 and 0927. The number of passengers and crew members were not given in the report. The report just stated that there were no victims. The ATR-42 has typically 46 to 50 passenger seats. A normal crew is two pilots and one cabin attendant. However, Aviation Herald reported there were 39 people on board and nobody were injured. Aviation Herald is the best source when it comes to factual reporting of airline incidents and accidents. It's hereby recommended. The captain was a male aged 37 years. He had a total of 3,433 flight hours, whereof 2,391 hours on ATR-42 and 72. He had 61 hours on ATR-42 and 72 as a captain. The first officer was also 37 years, and he had a total of 3,579 hours, whereof 2,484 hours on ATR-42 and 72. The flight from Bucharest to Chisinau was routine all the way until landing. The weather was good, it was daylight, and the reported wind was from 170 at 12 knots, maximum 18. Visibility was more than 10 kilometers, there were no significant clouds, and the temperature was 25 degrees. In other words, the weather was fine, and there was a crosswind from the right hand side. 12 to 18 knots crosswind should not be an issue for the pilots, because the ATR-42-500 had demonstrated it can be landed with full flap in 44 knots crosswind. But uh, things don't always go as planned. Here is an animation made by SIAA. In the foreword, it's written that it's not a realistic reconstruction of the event. In fact, the flight control deflections shown in the animation are not in accordance with the data from the flight data recorder. Therefore, I have made some changes. I removed the deflection of the elevators and spoilers because they had little importance for the outcome of the incident. Then I replaced the rudder deflection with the data from the flight data recorder. I also added a clock showing UTC time. Local time is two hours later. I did not remove or change the aileron position because uh, very little information was given in the report about this. Therefore, that information must be taken with a pinch of salt. Furthermore, I had to alter the rudder sequences for a few seconds to match the movement of the aircraft. The landing gear is down, the flaps is in full down position, 35 degrees. Finally, we have the torque indicators. They showed engine power, 
23 and 24 percent are normal values on final approach in landing configuration. At the start of the animation, the aircraft is 100 feet above the ground. The aircraft is stabilized on final and the first officer is flying manually. The indicated airspeed is 116.6 knots. The aircraft heading is 086.9 degrees and the track is 080.7 degrees. And for information, the runway heading is 083 degrees, so the aircraft is drifting slightly to the left. First, I will play the animation without interruption. Then I will break it down. OK, here we go. And now it's time to look at the details. At 100 feet above the runway, everything looks good. They cross the runway threshold at 20 feet. The norm is 50 feet. The aircraft touches down smoothly on both main wheels with a heading of 086 degrees. Since the runway heading is 083 degrees, it means they landed a bit sideways. Over the next two seconds, the first officer will add more left rudder and then neutralize the rudder. The nose wheel touches down. Those three white boxes under the wheels means that all wheels are on the ground. The first officer had applied a little right rudder to get the aircraft back on the runway center line. The speed is now 91 knots and the first officer says, yours, yes. The captain replies, what? Normal procedure is a handover of control at 70 knots. Apparently, the call from the first officer at a higher speed than normal must have surprised the captain. The report doesn't inform whether the captain took control of the aircraft at this time, or what they did later on. The report only states that the nose steering was never used, and that the brakes were only used for the last few moments before the aircraft stopped. Consequently, from now on, we don't know who did what. Therefore, I will use the term pilot, which can mean either of them. And what happened next is therefore a mystery. Full left rudder was applied and the aircraft veered to the left. Then full right rudder and the aircraft veered to the right. And then full left rudder again. Engine torque was then increased for a few seconds indicating they used reverse. The aircraft is now listing 5.7 degrees to the left and the right hand main wheel is above the ground for one second. As the speed is decreasing, the rudder loses authority and the aircraft exits the runway. Engine number two torque is increasing again, but this time because the power lever is brought forward, the torque will increase steadily to 25% which is maintained until the aircraft has stopped. When the aircraft re-enters the runway, the right hand main wheel hits a concrete base for a runway edge light. The rudder is still to the left, but has no effect. Engine 2 is now producing 21% torque. It is the thrust from this engine that causes the aircraft to continue turning to the left. And finally, after using the brakes, the aircraft comes to a standstill. And now I will play the video one more time without any stops.
The report concludes that the probable cause of this incident was, quote, the inadequate operation of the control column and rudder pedals after the aircraft touched down. End quote. Yes, I fully agree. Then the report states that one of the contributing factors was the failure to perform the descent checklist. What? I read from page 23 in the report. The descent checklist is performed during the approach flight. It includes, in addition to checking the aircraft system's operation, the landing brief section. In this section, the crew performs the following actions. Reviewing the approach and landing standard procedure for the runway in service. Yes. Checking the frequency of the radio navigation device used for the approach. Yes. Establishing the aircraft configuration for landing and the approach and touchdown speeds depending on the aircraft weight, the available runway length, the air temperature and atmospheric pressure, the wind direction and speed. Yes. Reviewing the missed approach landing procedure. Yes. Operation mode in case of unforeseen situations. We do a threat assessment and if we have to deviate from normal procedures, then it will be briefed. Review and brief crosswind landing technique for the D-crab flare and landing roll prior to the approach. No, no, no. We don't brief that. This is a skill you should have learned before you first solo, because almost every landing has some side wind. And finally, how to take control of the aircraft after touchdown when pilot flying is the first officer. No, we don't brief that. This procedure is clearly described in the manuals, and you learn it during your initial training in simulator. A normal checklist is not a user manual. A normal checklist is there to confirm that you have done the correct actions before the checklist is read. Therefore, the last line on the design checklist is to be read. Arrival briefing, complete, period. Because of this wording in the report, we got headlines like this. And more. The report only mentions that the crew failed to perform the descent checklist. But did they perform the approach briefing? And did they perform the other checklists? We don't know. The investigation revealed that it had become a common practice among the pilots to performing superficial checklists or no checklist at all. I will come back to this soon. Things started to go wrong after the first officer called yours, yes. Then the rudder was moved full left, full right and then full left again. The incident report states that the nose wheel steering was not used and the brakes were only used during the final moments before the aircraft stopped. But who of the pilots did what? 100 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Under normal circumstances, the first officer is pilot flying until reaching 70 knots. Then the captain will call 70 knots, I have control. Which means the captain will be responsible for nose steering, rudder, brakes and power levers. And the first officer will reply, you have control, and hold the control column, pushing forward and hold the ailerons into the wind. The report doesn't address the main question. Why did the pilot apply maximum rudder to both sides? Certainly, it was not because they didn't perform the descent checklist. In fact, human factors are not discussed in the report. So, what caused the pilots to act as they did? Was it because of fatigue? Or this because of improper training? And how was the interaction between the pilots? 
What is the background of the pilots? How were they selected by the company? And how was the captain prepared to become a commander? We don't know, and that is a pity. Both pilots had in excess of 1,000 hours before they started flying ATR-42 and 72. Then they accumulated around 2,400 hours in the ATR. This means they were pretty experienced. But the captain had only 61 hours as commander in ATR-42 and 72. This might be a contributing factor. You see, it takes some time to move from the right hand seat to the left hand seat. My experience, it takes maybe a couple of hundred hours for a new captain to get settled with the procedures. Not only will you change from being a first officer to a commander, but you must also retrain your muscle memory. Everything in the cockpit has a new position, and what you did with your left hand must now be done with the right hand, and vice versa. More important, the captain has a different role on the ground. It is the captain who operates the nose steering and, in most cases, the brakes. When landing on long runways, the first officers will uh, normally don't use the brakes. And when operating on short runways, it is common practice to let the captain land. They call it the captain's airport. Therefore, the use of brakes is part of the commander training. So, what's my take on this? The incident report leaves more questions than answers. We know that the rudder was operated excessively by one of the pilots. We know that the nose steering was not used and that the brakes were not used until the last moment. But we don't know who did what. As I mentioned earlier, there was a culture among the pilots where the checklists were not always performed. When procedures are repeated for a long period of time, they become mundane, and you may lower your guard. This opens up for the pilots, and especially the captains, to develop their own procedures. But this can be very dangerous. The manager of flight operations is responsible that the pilots are following checklists and standard procedures. This responsibility is delegated to the chief pilot and instructors in the fleet. If they are not doing their job properly, then flight safety is reduced. But since the report doesn't discuss this matter, we don't know how this worked in this company. Guys, if you are working as a pilot and start to find the flights mundane or even boring, don't let that all of you to compromise the safety. Every flight is different, and we cannot predict what will happen in the next moment. Flying can be hours with routine, and certainly followed by a moment of horror. Why do we have standard procedures and checklists? The answers are safety, safety, and safety. Therefore, you must be professional and never let your guard down, okay? And that's all for this time. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and happy learning. 100.